Welcome to the second video in the jet engine series. In the last video, we had a brief look at the thermodynamic cycle of a turbojet and how it looks like considering some of the inefficiencies of real life. We start now our in-depth look at each component of the gas turbine. And in this video, we'll define the engine stations, refresh a few thermodynamic concepts and start our analysis of the inlet diffuser. Let's dive in. Three, two, one, top. Three, two, one, half. The flight test engineering channel. First, we need to standardize on how we refer to each engine station. Historically, industry has not done a good job in harmonizing station numberings, with each OEM having its preference given the peculiarities of each design. The best attempt to harmonize is the standard published by SAE called AS755 Aircraft Proportion Systems performance station designation and nomenclature. What I'm showing here are the station numbers for a very simple turbojet with no bypass or fan. And this is just to get started and later on we'll address other configurations. Station A is the reference ambient condition from which we get static pressure and temperature. And the speed of the fluid is considered to be the airspeed of the aircraft. And we will use Mach number here to refer to fluid speeds throughout the series. Station one is at the face of the inlet as the airflow gently slows down to match the amount going into the engine. We'll have more details on this later on. Station two is at the face of the compressor. Station three is just before the combustor. Station four is at the exit of the combustor just before entering the turbine. Station 5 is at the exit of the turbine, and notice that th in this very simple model, there's only one turbine assembly with two stages. We'll cover our other configurations later. Station 8 is at the exit of the nozzle, which in our case here is the smallest cross section called the throat. There are designs where the nozzle is convergent divergent, and as such, we need to have a few more station numbers. And this is why we jumped from station 5 to 8. Also, there is no afterburner. And station 9 is going to be the ambient conditions after the nozzle. Now that we have these stations defined, the first component of our breakdown is going to be the inlet duct. What changes from ambient until we get to station 1? Well, for starters, what is the fluid speed at station 1? Is it the same as the aircraft? What if you're on the ground? Is it more? What if the aircraft is super fast? Is it less? It is all of these. Let's have a look at the flow lines. We have to look at the inlet considering what's going on with the airflow inside the engine. Except for the addition of fuel at the combustor, the mass flow through the inlet matches the flow downstream. When the aircraft is at standstill on the ground and we add power, the flow speed at station 1 will be such that speed times area times density, mass flow, is equal to that of the station 2. And as we go more and more upstream of station 1, the fluid speed drops with no change in density. So the area must grow to match the mass flow, giving this bell-shaped curve. Now, let's look at the case where the aircraft speed matches exactly the required flow speed for that particular density. Easy to see that the area at station A is the same at station 1 and the flow speeds will be the same. So last, what happens if the aircraft speed is faster than that required by the engine mass flow? Well, you guessed it. We have the opposite, where the area at station A is smaller than that at station 1, meaning that the flow will slow down. This concept is not only true if we consider the aircraft speed since what matters is mass flow through the engine. The same will happen when we change the throttle, for example. If flying at, say, cruise speed, by reducing the throttle, we get something similar to this. And vice versa. If we add throttle, you get the fast flow. And here we would need to think of the inlet's role. Ideally, it should be able to deliver air to the first stage of the compressor or fan at the right speed in order to optimize the angle of attack of the rotating blades. 
If you think about it, you start to understand why the SR71 has a movable spike in its inlet. And it becomes easy to see that always operating at the optimum point is impossible, especially for a fixed inlet like this one that we find in commercial jets. Here, we are already faced with the big dilemma for any jet engine designer. Which is the design point? To which condition should the engine be designed to? This will have consequences on all of the components. And in our case, for simplicity, we'll just establish these optimal conditions up front. We'll say that the design point for our turbojet engine is forward flight at Mach 0.8 and 35,000 feet, for example. So what effect should the inlet have in the flow? The inlet should work as a diffuser, slowing the airflow down. But how much? As we said, we want the ideal velocity at the face of the compressor. This in order to optimize the angle of attack of the blades. The typical values are between Mach 0.4 and 0.6. Notice that we're going from one station to the next, so it's useful to have in mind a few basic thermodynamic concepts. Let's jump to the notebook and have a look. If you want to follow along what I'm going to present here, you can search for flight test engineering on GitHub. This should lead you to our GitHub repository where we have all of the repos here. And if you go to gas turbine proportion, there you'll find the turbojet subdirectory. And here is the file for episode two and three. And if you click on this notebook file, you can see that we have all the equations exactly the same file I'm going to present here. And if you want to download this for use on your machine, you can click this button, download raw file, and then open on your own notebook server. Let's recap a few of them. So the first one is for isentropic processes. We can write the relationship between pressure and volume as this, PV to the gamma equals a constant K. And if you're using density, you can say that P equals K density to the gamma. Differentiating this relationship, you can get the dp value as is written here. We also have the uh, temperature relationship between T2 and T2 for an isentropic compression equals P2 over P1, gamma minus 1 over gamma. Or you can turn this around and write the relationship between the two pressures, P2 over P1. We also need to keep in mind the compressible version of Bernoulli's equation which correlates your P stagnation over P with your Mach number and the gamma of the fluid. And also the fact that the equations above are valid for a no loss condition. And if we want to have a better idea or a model of the actual process, we need to introduce the efficiency. So the efficiency is defined as the ratio between the isentropic compressor work that would have been applied to reach the compressed state over the real work applied to that, A to C, we call that. This can also be seen in the diagram here below as H2 being at the same pressure, meaning applying the same amount of pressure gain in your, in your compressor. However, this will have a higher enthalpy, meaning higher temperature, and a higher entropy. And finally, we need to keep in mind two other definitions. One is going to be the definition of Mach number, which is the speed over the local speed of sound, and the relationship between gamma, R, and Cp. We can now calculate the conditions at the inlet. When we talk about the state of a fluid, we quantify its energy state through its enthalpy. When the fluid has kinetic energy, then it is intuitive to see that this kinetic energy is something fundamental and compounds with pressure and volume to form its energetic state. We can then define a new enthalpy value for a theoretical state where all of the fluid's kinetic energy is transformed into pressure, volume, and temperature, maintaining the total energy value. This is called the stagnation quantity, and we'll use sub-zero to denote them. Zero from zero velocity or zero kinetic energy. And here we need a parenthesis to talk about fluid properties. We have seen gamma here, but how much is that exactly? If we simplify for air, the value is 1.4, and that's commonly used as a fixed value throughout many of the tutorials. 
But we have a better way to do this, especially in Python. We can use a library that gives us a much better approximation for many of the fluid properties that we will use throughout the series. Also because later on, we will burn fuel and we'll need to calculate the heat from the reaction, amongst other things. There are a few libraries that implement fluid properties or equations of states, EOS. The two most powerful are called CoolProp and Cantera. We'll be using Cantera here because it handles gas mixtures much better and is the library that we will use later on on a much more complex model. Okay, let's go back to our notebook and what are the equations for the inlet? We start with the conditions far away from the engine at station A for ambient. And the first assumption that we're going to make is that there are no losses from this station A until station 1, going from far ahead of the engine to the actual very first inlet section. No losses means that there is no change in energy, so stagnation pressure and temperature do not change, and we can state that they are equal. And that's what we're saying here, that uh, P01 equals P0A. And you can write the same thing for T01. And this one was easy, because no losses, just exchanging kinetic, kinetic energy for temperature and pressure as the air slows down to enter the diffuser means that the equations are easy. Now, for the adiabatic duct. So inside the duct, we have friction losses, but there we assume that there is no heat transfer as well. So adiabatic uh, transformation. If we have no heat transfer, then we can say that our stagnation temperatures are the same. T02 equals T01 equals, again, T0A. And we can write the same thing for T02. And with both equations, we can correlate between T1 and T2. Now, let's suppose for the moment that the change in pressure is isentropic. And because we know it is not, let's call this ideal temperature T02 prime. We can do a math trick here. And in order to, for T02 prime minus T1 to appear, we add one and subtract one, just as we did here. Now, we can go to the definition of efficiency to get T02 prime minus T1 and substitute the whole subtraction and get an equation for the pressure ratio here, this time including the efficiency, eta i. And we get the relationship between the static pressure at station 1 and the total pressure at station 2. Let's check if we have everything we need. We start at station A, where we have pressure, temperature, and Mach number. That checks. We calculate the stagnation values. Stagnation values are the same at station 1, so no loss. So we have those. And for this equation here, what is the flow velocity at station 1, V1? We could say it's the aircraft Mach number, but is it? Well, it's not. The velocity is tied to the mass flow of the engine. So we need to introduce m dot here at, uh, to be able to calculate the flow velocity and with it, the static pressure properties. So for flow, mass flow is going to be our m dot rho VA. Notice that if we know the mass flow in order to know the velocity, we need to know the fluid's density. From station A to station 1, this is easy because there are no losses. The problem is going from station 1 to station 2. If you recall, the inlet efficiency affects only the dynamic pressure since it's inherently tied to friction losses of the moving fluid. So we end up in a chicken and egg situation. We know the mass flow, sort of, more on this in a minute. Note that it does not change from station 1 to station 2, but in order to know the velocity, we need density, and density depends on pressure, which is affected by velocity. So how do we solve this? Well, there are a few ways, but we're going to use the iterative approach here. We're going to iterate. We guess the velocity, we apply the loss, or efficiency, we calculate the pressure, we calculate the density, and recalculate the velocity. And if they match, we're good to go. If not, we feed the new velocity back and repeat. We'll see this in the code just in just a second. One important note here on the mass flow. 
When we look at a jet engine like this, we see that the air enters the inlet and goes through all components and exits out in the back through the nozzle. So this is very important because a nozzle works as a mass flow limiter. If we are opening up, if we are operating at a high enough pressure at the exit of the turbine, we call that the critical pressure. And most of the time we are at this condition on a jet engine, the flow is said to be choked and the mass flow is fixed. So we would need to start from the nozzle and work our way up to figure out all the properties. But then you need to know the conditions at the nozzle, pressure, temperature. So again, it's a chicken and egg problem. And we're going to solve this in the same way, iterating. More on this later again, but uh, for now, it's sufficient to say that this is why we will create functions for each component in the code so that we can later in the video, we can call them one by one in a loop and iterate, do the iterations. And since we're talking about flight tests here, we need something real to compare our model to. The Orenda Mark 14 is the engine we're going to try to model. And it is very early, a very early turbojet. So no fan, zero bypass, very inefficient, but simple. It powered the Canadair Sabre. Thanks to William for letting me use his very nice pictures of the Orenda. And also I will show some footage from Agent JZ, which has an awesome channel dedicated to engines. And you should check it out if you haven't. The link is going to be in the description. Okay, and at this point, we're ready for our next video, where we'll start coding the solution for the inlet in Python. We'll organize our coding functions to enable us to iterate and solve for the engine. I'll see you there.